prayer now, shall we? Our Father God, thank you for this uh, ability and this vehicle of prayer to have our desires and our supplications, our wishes to come before you in the throne room of grace. And we come to you, Father, uh, uh, as a people who recognize the awesome and wonderful privilege this is and what makes it all possible, your son's sacrificing of himself for our sin. And we uh, rightfully need a Savior, a Messiah, and we're grateful for your plan of salvation and the one who loved us enough to offer himself uh, up as a sweet-smelling savor that we might be able to be able to communicate with you in this way. We come to you, Father, uh, before our midweek Bible study with the prayer requests of the saints, uh, prayers of thanksgiving, uh, prayers of uh, protection and travel, prayers for Father for those that are sick and ill amongst us. We ask that you would bless these requests as only you can. We're so grateful uh, that we're able to call on you because no one can bless like you care like you care and love like you love and we just know that uh, through you father all good things can happen we pray uh, that as we are about to enter into this class that you would open our heart open our hearts and minds to receive those things that come from your word that will straighten out our crooked paths and cause us to walk in a way that is well pleasing and acceptable in your sight be with those that are traveling and on their way continue to bless the work here in brookfield all the churches of Christ, uh, all over the world, particularly in our community, and we ask that these blessings in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 All right. Let's do uh, verse or two of hymn number 732. We praise thee, O God. Right? We praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, by the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, by the glory. Revive us again. We praise thee, O God. For the spirit of life, who has shown us our Savior and scattered the night. Hallelujah, by the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, by the glory. Revive us again. All glory and praise. To the Lamb that was slain, who has borne all our sins and has cleansed every stain. Hallelujah, by the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, by the glory. Believe <laughs> us again. Amen. We want to take a few moments and once again, thanks your friends, neighbors, co-workers, loved ones, associates, and the like. Uh, BrookfieldCOC.com and they will be able to see our uh, live stream tonight. And they click on the button at the top. If for some reason we can't see, uh, uh, take them to the videos and live stream page. And there, we won't see it because we're streaming, but they'll be able to see our uh, streaming tonight. We're going to continue meeting in the church basement while the weather is hot, so we're not competing with the uh, furnace next door. Uh, that furnace is uh, in the hallway, right above our classroom, the adult classroom, in the middle. And uh, it makes a little bit of noise when it comes on enough noise to mess with our audio track in our live stream. So that's the main reason for coming over here. I think I can talk loud enough to overcome it, but at least we don't have to compete with it that way. All right? Any questions before I get started? What's up? Is COC, what now? Brookfieldcoc.com. This is a, this is a, that's our website address, and you need to commit that to memory. <laughs> I don't know where I got the COC. 
There's going to be a, a test in a couple of weeks. <laughs> see if we can uh, see if we can pass it. Yeah, Brookfield COC COC stands for Church of Christ, and uh, that that will be able to uh, will be able to see it. All right. We're going to uh, hopefully close out the definition portion of our lessons tonight, and if we're blessed, we'll get into the characteristics. If not, characteristics, no matter what, we'll begin uh, next week. Now, we're, uh, our underlying tag for these studies are living free in the power and the peace of the Spirit. Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 11, we looked through last week. We won't do that again, but you can look it up at your earliest command that, that talks about that very idea. Now, we're talking about defining the Holy Spirit because we want to walk in the power and the peace of the Spirit in that way. Paul reminded the church in Corinth, in 1 Corinthians 6 and 19, saying, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the what, church? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God. You are not your own. So we looked at the Holy Spirit, and we talked about scriptures that dealt with the Spirit's personality. And we also looked at scriptures that dealt with the Spirit's divinity. So we learn from the Bible that the Holy Spirit is God, that the Holy Spirit has personality of, of his own. So then we, in our outline, we dealt with the idea of who the Holy Spirit is, looked at several scriptures for that, and the fill in the blanks that uh, corresponded to that. And then we talked about how the Bible describes the Holy Spirit. We looked at many different examples where that is concerned. Last week, we concluded with talking about the Holy Spirit's role before Pentecost. And we're talking about the Pentecost that happens in Acts chapter 2 in our New Testament uh, of the Bible. And then last week, we concluded with dealing with the Holy Spirit's role in the believer's life today. All right? And so we looked at a couple of things. We talked about one of the roles of the Holy Spirit is that he convinces us that we are sinners. That is the act of convict, convicting <laughs> or convincing. We read John 16 and 8 where that was concerned. We also saw that another role that the Spirit plays in the believer's life today is that he converts us from sinners to what? To saints. This is the act of regenerating, right? We looked at Titus 3, verse number 5, where that is concerned. Another role of the Spirit is that he cleanses us and places us, baptizes us, into the body of Christ. This is the act of baptizing. 1 Corinthians 12 and 13 tells us, For in one Spirit we were all what? Baptized into what? One body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one Spirit. We also saw that the Holy Spirit role for us today, or the role that he plays today in uh, believers' lives, is that he comes to live within us. We saw that earlier in the First Corinthians text that we read. This is the act of indwelling. Have you ever heard that said, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? That's what's being referred to there. First Corinthians 6, verse number 19, and if you notice, we use a lot of First Corinthians passages. It's a very good book to read where the Holy Spirit is concerned, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God, you are not your own. Okay? That's where we're up to. That's a quick review, and that takes us to where we are today, continuing to talking about the role of the Spirit in the believer's life today. So let's start off by uh, looking at the fill in the blank. All right? We're talking about the role of the Spirit here, John 14 and 26, let me, I'll do it that way first, back up, I think that's what I did last week. There, Jesus says, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will do what? He will teach you what? All things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. So what do you think the role of the Spirit is? He what? He counsels. He counsels us in the way we should go. This is the act of teaching. Very good. Did we do that one last week? Yeah. Oh, that's 
That's fine. That's easy. <laughs> All right, so that's another one of the roles of the Spirit. We have another one that we see in Ezekiel 36 and verse 27. And there the Bible says, And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. So here, what are we saying? That he blanks us to obey God's will. What do you think from that verse? Causes. Causes. Very good. He causes us to obey God's will. This is the act of empowering. Okay? I'm going to talk about this more as the class goes on. I'm going to try not to park here. I don't want you to take the idea of empowering as uh, that the Spirit overtakes you and makes you do things. Right? He equips you to do things. Mm -hmm. We still have to make the choice in order to obey God's commands. The Spirit does not make us obey God's commands. That would be a violation of our free will. God gave us free will because he loves us, right? And what's incumbent with free will is the idea that you can freely choose to do whatever you want to do, all right? So we, we, we have the, uh, the choice, we have the free will to disobey God. Now, the world has a problem with that because um, they believe the evidence of evil in the world is an evidence that God is e either uh, not all-powerful or not all-loving or there is no God. And the fact that there's evil in the world is not evidence of the absence of God. It is the evidence of free will. It's the evidence that we get to choose. Because if you can make the case that evil proves that there is no God, then equivalent to that statement is good is means that there is a God. Right? right. And so it, it, that coin is double-sided, and, and we can't allow people just to say just because they're evil there is no God without considering the good that's in the world. Because if there's good, if you're saying evil means there's no God, then that means good means there is a God. <laughs> And then we can continue that conversation by saying, and how do you know what's good without knowing what is evil? Right. All right? All right, so that, that we won't walk down that path too far. Okay? Let's look at Acts 13. This will help us out with our next fill in the blank. In Acts 13 and verse number 52, the Bible says, And disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. So when we go back to the fill in the blank, uh, he blanks our behavior. What do you think he does? What do you think the Spirit does? This kind of goes in line with what I was trying to say last time. He influences. And he influences our behavior by, like Jesus said for the disciples, bringing uh, us to remembrance those things that he has taught before. Okay? And so... The ability of the Spirit to influence you is proportionate to your studying of the things that he has told us or taught us. Does that make sense? Explain, okay. explain control. Control? Yeah, that's, I, I don't like that word. I, I was going to take that out of there. Because control does not mean, once again, he overtakes us. Right? I'd rather stick with the word influences there. Right? Mm -hmm. Let me put control down. How about that? <laughs> this is one of those uh, shoot the meat, spit out the bones. Is that what yeah, you ever said? Yeah, yeah. And it's, the Holy guide. Spirit does not. Should you say guides? Yeah, I like guides, absolutely. It could be guides. I mean, he's a, he's a counselor, he's a helper. Mm -hmm. These are all different words that different translations even use where the Holy Spirit is concerned. So he, he is a helper. And so if we're going to, and if one were to say he's under the control of the Spirit, what you're really saying is you're under the influence of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, we are live lives that are influenced by the Spirit because we are, that we study and believe and obey God's commands. And that's where the Holy Spirit gave us God's word. So that's our influence is the word of God. We get the word of God from the Spirit that 
move faithful men along to reveal those things that we now know as scripture. Right, Brother Yassi? Yeah, I was going to say that when you use the word influence, the Holy Spirit influence us, it helps us. It's, he's the helper, so he helps us control our behavior. I like that too. <laughs> I like that too. As long as we don't get the idea that the Holy Spirit takes over oh, yeah. uh, and possesses us and causes, uh, makes us do what's right. That, that is, once again, a violation of free will, and God is not going to do that. Right? That would violate his own character of love, because love demands a choice. You can't be a loving God and not administer free will to his creation. Okay? One other thing, that's why the Bible tells us to be full of the Holy Spirit. That's right. The more full you are, yeah. the more control <laughs> you are under. Okay? That makes sense? All right, so that's good. This is the act of filling. Right? This is what I was trying to explain a couple Wednesdays ago, too, when I was talking about this idea of when we, when we consider the indwelling of the Spirit, I consider the, the word presence as well, too. Right? And measure is another word I remember. You guys remember that? A greater measure of the Spirit as well. All right. Our next fill in the blank comes from Romans 8 and verse number 26. Likewise, the Spirit what? Helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. So we go back to the fill in the blank there. Uh, he, talking about the Spirit, communicates, I'm just going to give you that one, communicates <laughs> our unspoken prayers. Because we don't always know what we ought to pray for, right? Mm -hmm. The scripture just said. Mm -hmm. and so he intercedes for us with groanings too deep for, for words. This is the act of interceding. Right? Now, this is not uh, what Commonly, people would believe is uh, speaking in tongues, right? right? This is uh, because this this type of interceding is beyond words, right? So this is when people see this this thing, this groanings, they think grunts or they think indistinguishable sounds, and that's not what that is at all. But the spirit doesn't need to make sound. To intercede for us. If I understand that, mm -hmm. say it again. The Spirit doesn't need to make sound or need to cause us to make sound for Him to intercede for us. As a matter of fact, we do understand this. Anybody ever hear, ever say a silent prayer? Yeah. Make any noise? No. You think God heard and understood what you said? Yeah. Yeah. Silently? Yeah. Okay. Well, the Holy Spirit is even closer. To God than we are, right? And He would not have to make any noise either for that to happen. So this is that's this is not a tongues issue. The Spirit intercedes for us on our behalf. He indwells us. He's influencing us. He's controlling us. He understands intimately what our struggles are. Amen, Church. Amen. He understands, right? And so, with that understanding, He is the perfect interceder intercessory vehicle for us. I made up a word. <laughs> Interceder. <laughs> but we understand that, right? <laughs> so the Spirit is, is, is the perfect one. It's the same way that Jesus is a faithful high priest uh, or a high priest that can sympathize with our human experience. Why? Because he was tempted in all ways, such as we get without sin. He became human. That's right. Right? He understands temptation because he went through it. And the Holy Spirit indwells us and, and is walking alongside of us, walking with us. He's with us all the time. And he is able to intercede because he understands what our struggles are. Right? And he knows what to pray for. We, we're praying for, for things sometimes. That may not be what we need. I'm trying to think of an example, but we might ask God, if we're having difficulty with something, 
we might ask God to remove the something we're having difficulty with, right? Uh, or someone. <laughs> Straight to the point. <laughs> well, removing the thing or the person may not be what's best for you to develop you the way God wants you to develop you. So the Spirit prays in a different way. The Spirit's going to pray that uh, we would perhaps be helped to come to a better understanding of this difficulty rather than a removing of this difficulty. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You all understand that? So that's how the Spirit uh, intercedes for us. Okay? Any questions on that before I move forward? Comment? Think of the moment you saw the thing out of stuff. Did you have any idea what was going through your mind or what your prayer was going on? I didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> spirit did. Yeah. So there is, I mean, it, it, the spirit was already working. You just go sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes. Yeah, we don't, like you've said many times before, we, uh, we don't even know the right questions to ask about spiritual things, mostly, but the Spirit does. So he intercedes for us on that behalf. Any others? All right, let's look at 1 Corinthians 1 and 22. Let's help us with our next one. And who has also put his what? His seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. So when we look at this and try to fill in the blank, uh, he confirms our destiny in heaven. Right? As, as long, church, as long as we are willing to struggle in our faith, we have hope of heaven as our home. Now notice I didn't say you had to be a perfect Christian. You, you had to be able to quote all scriptures and all that. You just have to be willing to struggle. If you're willing to fight, if you're willing not to, I mean, Look at uh, a man like David, right, who had some grievous sins. He was an adulterer, amen? Yeah. He was a murderer, amen? Yeah. Does anybody in this room tonight have any doubt that David is going to make it to heaven? That's because he struggled with his faith. He wrestled with God, and he never turned away from God. He, he never served other gods. He didn't serve himself. Right? And so we have we have that same hope as well. We we can have that same type of guarantee, and that's because we've been sealed uh, with the Holy Spirit, and that is a guarantee for us. As long as we're willing to, to walk in the Spirit, as long as we're willing to uh, obey the Spirit, and obedience is not perfection, right? Obedience is a willingness to comply to the will and the way of God. As long as we have that, and God knows our hearts. He knows whether we're sincere or not. Now, you can fake it in front of me. But you can't fake it in front of God. God knows whether or not you're sincere or not, whether you legitimately are trying. As long as you do that, heaven can be your home. Heaven will be your home. All right? This is the act of sealing. That we have here. Okay? So those are some of the roles of the Holy Spirit in the believer's life today. Right? If you look through that list there, that's something you can always look back in, in your study. So this brings us to a question as we continue to try to define what the Holy Spirit is. And that is, are the spirit and the soul of a person the same thing? What do you guys think? No. No. Anybody any yeses here? Now they're very close. <laughs> they're very close, but but they are different. And one of the, one of the things I like to point to is, um, and I'm gonna hope we'll have time because I, I was going through some of my my own studies with you all. I ran across a diagram I shared with you all a couple years ago called the Triune Man. We'll talk. We'll hopefully show that again tonight as well. But where our bodies are concerned, is our body going to heaven? No. 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 So it is going to return what? Yes. That's the ground from which it came. Right. Now, when we were when we were animated, when we were brought to life, God formed us from that dust of the ground, right? right. And then he blew 
He breathed into us, and then man became a living being, a living soul. That that breath that animated that dirt uh, is the spirit, right? No man lives without the spirit of God. The spirit gives life. Amen? Amen. So the body goes back to the dusty ground from which it made. Where did that breath come from? That breath that animated that dirt. It came from God. The Bible also tells us that the spirit goes back to God who gave it. Right? So that, that leaves something different. And that something different is the soul. And I like to say the soul goes with who the soul follows. The soul follows the body. He's going to go to a similar place like the dirt. <laughs> the soul follows the spirit. He's going to go to a similar place, that which God. Now, I used an example two years ago, and that was a glass of water. And I asked you all to tell me what was in that glass of water. And we recognize that a glass of water, the chemical composition of that is what? H2O. H2O. Two parts of? One part of? So in a glass of water, we have hydrogen and oxygen, right? But if you look at that glass of water, that's not a glass of hydrogen. Amen? Amen. You look at that glass, it's not a glass of oxygen. That's right. Right? But there's hydrogen in that glass. And there's oxygen in that glass. But what we see is what? Water. water. That is the example that I try to use to explain uh, the body, soul, and spirit. Although we only recognize the two things, the body and the spirit, the coming together of those two things have caused a third thing to exist, right? And man became a living being, a living soul. Does everybody understand that? Okay, we got here. So the soul is what's going to be judged. That's right. Okay. It's the soul is going to be judged. The body's been judged. It's going to the dust of the ground. The spirit's been judged. It's going back to God who gave it. What's left? The soul. All right. So the soul is what stands the judgment. Right. So yes, or in certain passages, uh, the Bible refers to the spirit, soul, and body to indicate the whole person. When it talks about body, soul, and spirit, sometimes in the Bible, it's referring to the whole person. And that whole person is made up of those three things, body, soul, and spirit. The soul and the spirit are very close to one another, but they are not exactly the same thing. The soul is very much like the spirit, right? But what, what we also learn is that we're really not human beings, right? We're really what? We're really spiritual beings in a human experience or living in a human uh, experience, right? Because we're going to shed this human experience for an eternal spiritual experience. And that spiritual experience going to be the one that follows the dust of the ground or the one that follows the spirit back to God. If I understand that so far? Okay? Alright, so, but in other places in, uh, the words body and spirit are used to denote the whole person. Now let's look at some scriptures. The main one that deals with the triune nature of man, man being uh, trichotomous in his uh, makeup, meaning three parts, is found in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse number 23. Somebody read that. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. All right, so here we have the three different terms mentioned in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse number 23. We also see how close the two are together because the Hebrew writer tells us in Hebrews 4 and 12, somebody read this. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. All right, so these things are very close to one another, aren't they? Soul and spirit are very much alike. What can divide them? The word of God. Okay? The joints and marrow. Very close to each other. What can divide them? Something like the word of God. The thoughts and intentions of the heart are very close. What can divide them? 
the word of God, right? So uh, this shows how close, because the Hebrew writer shows us just how close together the spirit and the soul are, but they're not the same thing, right? And we can see that in those examples that we just mentioned. So let's talk a little bit more about the makeup of a person, all right? Makeup of us human beings, all right? We see, I'll, I'll, I'll just fill, we'll just go through these. The body, which is soma in the Greek, S-O-M-A, is the material part of a person that constitutes the physical anatomy, flesh, bones, blood, okay? When those things are referred to in scripture, we're talking about the what? The physical, the body, all right? All right? Everybody with me? All right, the, the soul, right, which is uh, suke in Greek, is the immaterial, rational part of a person that produces behavior through the mind, will, and emotions. So when we talk about the soul, we're talking about the mind, the will, and the emotions of a person, that part of him that is immaterial. It's not physical like the body, it's immaterial. And it deals with the rational part of a person. That person that produces behavior, that decides the behavior that he's going to do. It is the soul that determines whether he's going to obey God or not. Okay? The body calls for one thing, the spirit calls for another thing. And the soul has to determine or decide which way it's going to go. Make sense? Okay. Now, let's talk about this mind uh, a little bit more. The mind, we can see in Acts 15 and 24. Let me, let's go there first. Somebody read this. Since we have heard that some persons have gone out from us and troubled you with words, unsettling in your mind, although we gave them no instruction. All right, so when we talk about the mind, we're talking about the way a person thinks. Mm -hmm. Talking about you, the way you think. It's, it's your thinking that we are referring to, right? And what the uh, Acts 15 was talking about there was that some things were taught that, that unsettled the way that they were thinking, the way they had been thinking. Paul had talked in one way, people came behind, taught a different way, okay? So the mind deals with thinking. Everybody got that? Mm -hmm. All right, the will... Is, a, is something else. Somebody read Ephesians 6 and 6. Not by the way of high service as people pleasing, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. All right, so the will deals with desires. So the mind deals with thinking. The will deals with desires, right? That's why we want to set our hearts on obeying God. Sets up, set our hearts on the will of God. So that our thinking will also follow that way as well. And then, so we talked about the mind, and we couldn't talk about it all night, but we're trying to get through this. Mind, we talked about the will, big desires. Let's look at the emotions. See what you think that is. Somebody read First Peter 1 and verse 22. And it purified your soul by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love. Love for one another earnestly from a pure heart. Love one another earnestly from a pure heart. When we're talking about the emotions, we're talking about feelings or affections. Okay? That's what we're talking about. So mind deals with the thinking. Will deal, deals with our desires and our emotions. Deal with our feelings. All those things are found in the soul of a person. Right? immaterial part of the person. Everybody understand that? Mm -hmm. All right. So now, to look at a difference, the slight difference, let's look at the spirit. Right? So the, the spirit is uh, pneuma in the Greek. And it refers to the immaterial, innermost part of a person, the human spirit. Okay? So the, when we say the soul, we're not talking about the innermost part of the person. But when we talk about the spirit, we're talking about the, the innermost part of it. Now, one way to think of this is think of the tabernacle or the temple, right? In the in the 
temple, we had on the outside was the what? The outer court. Right. And then you move close, you move more inward, more, more towards the inner part, and you had what? The holy place, right? Oh, the holy place. Yeah. And then and when you move to the innermost part of the, you had what? Holy, the holy of holies. Okay? But that's one way to look at that. If you want to make an analogy, the outer court would be the body, the soul would be uh, the holy place, and the spirit would be the holy of holies. Okay? Everybody see that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's just illustration. So this deals with the immaterial, innermost part of a person, the human spirit. Now, in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 4 and 5, somebody read. But God can enrich you Even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. By grace, you have been saved. Okay? So, uh, needs to be made, we're talking about the Spirit, needs to be made alive to God. Right? Mm -hmm. Alive to God. When we get the Spirit in our firstborn nature, we are alive to the world. We, we, are, we have life. But when we are born again, the Spirit is made alive to God. God being rich in mercy because of his great love, which he loved us, even when we were dead. You all see that? Mm -hmm. Even when we were, when were we dead? In our trespasses. In our trespasses. That was before we were born again, before we were baptized. But when we were baptized, we were made what? Uh -huh. Alive together with Christ. By grace, you have to say. Everybody understand that? Yes. Okay. All right, let's look at another passage. So we're going to talk about how uh, the Spirit and how the Spirit works within us as well. This innermost, innermost part of us. Somebody read John 4, 23 and 24. But the hour is coming and is now here. When the true worshiper can worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Must worship the spirit and truth. So here in John 4, verses 23 and 24, we see that the spirit communes with God. Allows us to commune with God. We've been made alive with God, and now we're able to commune with God. Everybody with me so far? Yeah. All right, we're going to do one more, and this is going to be in 1 Thessalonians. We're going to Put, put all this together even more. First Thessalonians 5 and 10. Somebody read that. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Might live with him. So here, uh, the Spirit causes us that we can live together with Jesus forever. That's what First, first Thessalonians 5 and 10 has there, right? All right, so now you should have all your fill in the blanks done for the yeah. definitions part of the class, right? Mm -hmm. All right, so let's take a little closer look at this idea of the triune man. I don't know if any of you all remember this, okay? When we talk about the body of man, we have some scriptures that are helpful for us. In Genesis 2 and verse number 7, let me have a reader. Somebody read that. Then the Lord God formed the man from out of the dust of the ground. Are right, you going to stop right there. So that's, that's the what part of man? The flesh, the body, right? In Genesis 3 and verse 19, what does the Bible say there? Somebody read. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground. Keep this from making you taste it. For just as you are, the just will be able to All right. Any, any, everybody understand that? Mm -hmm. So the, we saw in Genesis 2 and 7 where the body came from. It came from the dust of the ground, right? right. If there's any mistaken of it, we also see... The Lord tells us that it is to that dust we are going to return. Amen, if you understand. Amen. Amen. Hold on if you don't. <laughs> All right. Genesis 18 and 27. Somebody read that one. And Abraham spoke up again. That I've been so bold as to speak to the Lord, though I am nothing but dust now. So Abraham, speaking to God, understanding where he came from, referred to himself as what? Dust and ashes. Dust and ashes. So when we talk about that, and when the Bible talks about that, we're talking about what part of the man? 
the flesh, his body. Okay? So this is what I came up with to uh, refer to the body. All right? This is the body. You see that up there? And one of the things I want you to know about the body is that the body is worldly conscious. It is fleshly conscious. It is carnal. Right? It is physical. And it is also temporal. Now, what does that mean? It won't be around long. It's temporary. That's right. Okay? And some of the ways that we interact with the body are through our senses of hear, see, taste, smell, feel. And for uh, most of the world, they live their whole lives in accordance to these senses. If it feels good, it must be good. If it looks good, it must be good. If it smells good, I got to have some. Everybody understand? Are you still with me? Say amen. Need some more help? Say slow down, Brother Johnson. Okay. Let's talk about the nephesh or the rock of man, the soul of man. Or the, this is the spirit, the, the, the life-giving portion, the innermost part of man. Genesis 2 and 27. Somebody read uh, the parts that aren't crossed off because this is from that same verse of earlier we talked about the body. And breathe into the nostrils the breath of life. The breath of life. Okay? That's the ra or the nephesh or the ra of man, which is the breath of God, the spirit of God, right? And Genesis 6 and 3 gives us some more definition. Somebody read that, Genesis 6 and 3. And the Lord said, my spirit will not contain the human flesh that is in it all more. Then they will be a hundred and twenty. All right, so God lets us know in this passage that his spirit will not remain in the dust of the ground forever. Everybody see that? Everybody understand that? Okay. And in Genesis 6 and 17, what does the Bible say there? All right. So if we perish when the breath of life leaves us. Everybody understand that? Okay, we're all with us. So the breath of life gives the, the, the God's breath, nephesh, gives us life. It causes us to live. Without that, when that leaves us, we die. That's another part of man. All I'm trying to do is speak to the different parts of man, even though two of them are very, very close together, the soul and the spirit. The spirit is not like the body. Right? We can see that plain, right? Okay? And the, and the body is not like the spirit. And so let me do the spirit this way. Okay? So this is the spirit. We saw the bigger green part was the body. It was world conscious. But the spirit is smaller. It's the innermost part of man. The spirit is God conscious. Mm -hmm. The spirit is aware of God. The Bible even tells us that, right? Right. Okay? And the way that the spirit is not temporal, it is eternal. Okay? And it operates through the fruit of the spirit. And you, you can go through those to, uh, we, let's just name some. Peace. Love, joy. Love, peace, joy. Long peace, suffering. We like to leave that one out, right? Suffering. Patience. Okay? When we operate in those things, we operate in a spirit. And those things are immaterial. And those things are immaterial. And those things are the things of God. Okay? So we want to walk in the spirit. We operate in those things. Okay? If we put the two together, this is what we have. Okay? But one of the reasons I drew this is to show you this is incomplete. There's something missing here. Where's the mind? Where's the will? Where's the emotions? Okay? They're not in this, right? We have the body, which is here in the green. It's world conscious. It's always going to lean towards the world, and it's going to deal with the world through its senses, right? And it's going to lean to those things that are carnal <laughs> and physical. But that's not good for man because those ways are temporal, okay? Which is why... The Bible teaches us, the Bible teaches us 
to have control of these things so that we can yield to these things. Because these things give us eternal life. That's right. Not temporal life. Okay? Everybody with me? Yeah. Alright, let's, let's complete this picture. The soul of man. Also, we can go back to Genesis 2 and 7. And now, if we looked at what we have already looked at, the Bible says what? And the man the big. Everybody with me? Say amen. Yeah. Now, let's go back to 1 Thessalonians 5 and 23. Somebody read that. May God exalt the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then we also have the same scripture again. Hebrews 4 and 12, it lets us know that a difference can be distinguished. Oftentimes it takes the word of God, but go ahead. So when the, for the word of God is alive and active, God will release the word of God. It can be said that he needs to be divided soul and spirit, so the man will be judged in God and the All right. You, you, you can fool me, but you can't fool God, because he can, just, he can distinguish between your thoughts and and your attitude, your intentions, okay? And that's what we have to do. Just because you have a simple thought does not mean you have to act on it. Mm -hmm. Say it again. Just because you have a simple thought does not mean you have to act on it. So when people in the world say, God made me this way, they only, that's only an excuse because we all have sinful thoughts. Wow. Yes, Mary. For those that can't see her in internet land. <laughs> the thing is, we have to operate in the spirit. That's right. And the part of the spirit is self control. control. And it will take us away from the temporal and lead us towards the eternal. Amen, if you can. Okay? So the, the soul, I represent it this way. Now remember, the body was world conscious. That's right. The spirit was God conscious. The soul is self conscious. Okay? And it operates through these things. Will, mind, and emotion. And you see other things that are in play with those three. Reason, desire, personality. All those things are a matter of a person's soul. Is that helpful, church? Yes, very. Okay? So when we put them together, now we have this. Right? Now we have a more complete picture of what the Bible describes. We have that which comes from the world, we have that which comes from God, and then we have that which when those put together, now we have the hydrogen and the oxygen, make something totally different, the water, now we have the triune man. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, the soul is what our teaching and our dilemma is all about. Right? And what we want to be able to do is that we want the soul to become more like the spirit. That's right. 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 Okay. When we're first born into the world, I would my analogy, which doesn't have to be perfect, but my analogy when we first come into the world, this is our first born nature. With the body, you're talking. With the body. All, all three. All three. All three. When we come into the world, this is what we're like. And as we stay in the world, this is what winds up happening. Let me see if you can notice what's happening. I can make it happen on the screen. It's moving. It's moving. See that? Let me try, let me try one more time. This is where we started, and this is what winds up happening. What's happening? We're becoming more what? We're becoming more worldly. We're becoming more and more worldly conscious, right? But then, we start to hear God's word. And that word penetrates our soul. It, does. it starts to work on our mind. And that mind then 
starts to determine, starts to desire that word. And it starts moving away from those things. And what winds up happening is, let's get some scripture first. Somebody read Romans 10 and 17, which is, which is why this is a powerful scripture church. You should right. know this. That's right. Uh, and as our eternity right. workshops come, let's be able to say this. Romans 10 and 17 says what? Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message. And the message is, is heard through the word about Christ. So see, God determined that he could still work through the body and still get his message into the soul. That's right. By preaching the message about his son. Because that's what saves us now, right? Everybody got that? Mm -hmm. And then Hebrews 11 and 6 says what? Yeah, without faith it's impossible to please him. To for whoever would uh, draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. And so when we hear that word, we should be convinced to do this. Right. Be baptized. Because that's what happened on the day of Pentecost, right? That drawing line that we're using to define some of the roles of the Holy Spirit. They cried out, what must we do? Because they heard a message about Christ. And they were told to do what? Be baptized. Be baptized. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of your sins. So that now, when we are baptized, we were here. Now, look and see what begins to happen. Remember, we already defined what happens. The Spirit starts to indwell us. That's right. Influence us. Control us. Not to control the way we were thinking. Everybody with me? That's right. Then this starts to happen. Now we are more under the influence. Well, now what do we see more of? Do we see more green? Or do we see more of the oh, that's pink or whatever? That is red. <laughs> I wanted it to be red because of God's words were in red, but you couldn't see that on a black background. So. And one thing about me comes within the, the pink, spirit. but the green. There we go. Because even though we're not, we're I like that. Thank you, teacher. Because even though we are controlled and influenced by the spirit, we are still in the world, right? But those things now, the spirit has. We have a greater measure of the spirit in us now that now allows us to be led by the spirit. Amen. Amen. Any questions? Yeah, talk. And through the course of life, that red might gravitate. But the thing is, it should never, it should never stop. It should always be trying to achieve the entirety. Of the exactly world. right. When we read about perfection in the New Testament, perfection in the New Testament is not uh, Jesus. <laughs> it's not. Uh, it's not the destination. Right. It's the journey. That's right. It, it's a continuation. Sanctification uh, never stops happening here on earth. That's right. So that's why the <clears throat> illustration, I think, is a good one because the spirit should be growing in us, taking over more and more control of us, or more and more influence of us, indwelling us a greater measure of the spirit so that when we respond now, we respond in the spirit. The, the, our mind, our desires are for the spirit. When we do things, the reason we do things are because of the spirit. Mm -hmm. And all these things that we that we put in here, our personality, our character, we should be shaped and molded into the image of his son. Right? And I just think it makes a lot of a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Right? Especially when you realize that, that the body is world conscious, the spirit is God conscious, the soul is self-conscious. God's word allows, uh, reveals us to him. W without God's word, we wouldn't know we had the spirit in us. It's God's word that allows us to know that the spirit of God is in us. And for us to draw closer to him, the spirit needs to be made alive towards God so that we can commune with him. That's why we saw some of those words in our definition there. And that growing of the spirit allows us to walk in a way and in a manner that is well pleasing to God. When we get to a point like this, where he just takes over. Mm -hmm. Not takes over where we're possessed <laughs> and out of our mind, but, but takes over in a, in a way that we 
we are influenced to do good rather than evil. That's why the Bible tells us things like study to show yourself approved. Be able to rightly divide the word of truth. All of it makes a lot of sense this way. Any comments? All right, that's our lesson. Now, if you want that chart, I put it on my website. And you can go to the Bible class portion of the website, and underneath the definitions, look right by the definitions, you'll see uh, this chart, the PowerPoint. This is a PowerPoint. And we can make a move. Huh? We can make a move. Uh, you can make a move. Oh, that's all right. Then. <laughs> make a move. I want to make a move. <laughs> you want to make a move. <laughs> well, you know, if you sit down, and, and this is a good uh, teaching tool uh, for someone, uh -huh. and to, as adults, when you have visuals, like that. Oh, absolutely. It stays. Yeah. It stays with you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if you all think of some other things to add to that that would be good, please share them with me. Okay. Somewhere in there, put all that is generated by your, your free will. This is free. This yeah. is free will will be good. Consciously yes. doing this. Right. That's good. It's uh, all in all good. Great teaching. All right. Then we're going to stop right there. Our time is up. And as far as our announcements are concerned, I don't have any more comments or questions. Uh, from 3 to 5, we're going to have our website seminar. Uh, Anita may not be able to make it, but I will be here. All right, 3 to 5. And then uh, Greg wants to remind the men about the men's retreat, which is July 26th. What's this word again? Kisha. 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 Yes. It's out near Star Rock. <laughs> All right. And then uh, Carrie asked me to put this in, slide that he made. This is going to be Friday night. Uh, we're going to show the movie is Genesis History. That's going to begin at 6 o'clock. And we're going to be in the basement. On this Friday? No, the 19th. It's going to be next Friday. So you got a week to plan. Next Friday, the 19th, 6 o'clock, here in the basement. Hot food served, hot dogs, chips, and soda. What about steak? <laughs> <laughs> steak, hot, steak, hot dog. Tuesday, Tuesday, Tuesday. <laughs> Fellowship and love served also, he said. That's all right. If you have any questions, please contact, contact Brother Banks. Any other announcements? Church? Oh, song supper. Oh, song supper, yes. September 14th. September 14th. Try to make a slide to get that in here too. At your house. All right. Mm -hmm. At Shirley's house. Okay. What time? Twenty to three. I I think we suggested three. That people <laughs> okay. time to do stuff in the morning and uh, absolutely. Anyway, so. Any others? No. All right. Then let's sing our song and uh, uh, brother uh, brother Banks. We close this out, please. Once from my poor sin sick soul. Christ did every bird of gold. Now I walk with thee at home, hand in hand with Jesus. Hand in hand we'll walk each day, hand in hand along the way. Walking thus I will not stray.